Okay. Hello. Good morning, everyone. So it's going to just be me this morning. Jake is out. Um, he's having a birthday weekend, so he's not really working this weekend, which is very fair. Um, Nick is also not here. We're trying to get him on the live stream, and hopefully, I think not this week, obviously, but next weekend, I think Nick will come and join the live stream. So you guys will finally meet all three of the founders at once. And uh, Nick is just like a super introvert, so it took some convincing, but he is going to be coming. Also, I just really quickly wanted to apologize about last week's live stream. We got a comment saying that it wasn't really cool that we were kind of kind of laughing at some stocks. Like someone I believe asked us about AMC and me and Jake were both kind of just like giggling a little bit like, oh, you know, we don't really like this stock. Um, then we got a comment, someone basically saying that that was unprofessional and they didn't like it because you never know. Someone could hold that stock and then we're basically laughing at someone's stock. So that's not our goal here on the channel. Definitely not our goal. And I think it's really important to address that really quickly and just say it was kind of unprofessional of us and we never want to laugh at your guys' stocks. We kind of want to explain our reasoning why we may not like them instead of just laughing at, you know, um, a stock we don't think is very fundamentally sound. So going forward, that is definitely going to be something we work on. And it's it, it's just hard because me and Jake are bros, right? We're best friends. So we do get kind of carried away in just like the, the banter and everything. But we're going to work on that in the future. All right. So hello, everyone who is here so far. Um, we're going to take a look at some stocks later on in the video. I just want to start off by talking about what happened in the stock market this week. <laughs> I... I know SM Finance, I know, but I still, we, we don't want to laugh at people's stock picks. Um, we want to explain what, what we think about them and why. Um, anyways, we're going to get started here, and I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to talk about basically what happened in the stock market this week. So right here, I took some screenshots. I have a Daniel Pronk slideshow coming at you guys. So right away... Earlier on this week, the stock market rallied about 6.3% from October 3rd to about October 5th. And this rally was kind of insane. I mean, it was at the beginning of the week, stocks opened up and they just went nuts. The reason the stocks ran so much this week, starting the week, was because the UN called on the Fed and other central banks to halt interest rate increases. So basically, the United Nations was like, hey, Governments around the world, you guys should really stop increasing interest rates. And this caused the stock market rally that started off the week. You, I'm sure that we all know by now that rising interest rates is a bad thing for stocks. And if interest rates do keep on rising, then stock valuations are most likely going to continue coming down. So the UN saying, or basically asking the Fed and other central banks to stop raising interest rates caused stocks to rally like crazy because that would be a good thing ultimately for the stock market. Then later on this week, um, once the market peaked, the market fell back down 4.4%. So stocks were just incredibly volatile. They spiked massively at the beginning of the week, and then they fell into the back half of the week. And I'm sure that we all saw that in our own portfolios. Basically, the last two days of this week, my portfolio was just bleeding out. And it was just kind of crazy to see after this, this massive rally that we had. So why did the market do this? Like we already explained why the market went up so much, but why did the market fall in the end of the week, the last two days here? Well, it's because the U.S. job report came out and basically the U.S. job report was very strong. Unemployment is continuing to fall in the United States. And this is a problem for the Fed because the Fed is worried about the strong U.S. labor market. So it, it, we're in this very interesting time right now where it's almost like good economic news is bad for the stock market because good economic news means that the Fed is going to continue increasing interest rates, which means that people are going to sell off their stocks and um, basically lower stock valuations. So it's almost like the market right now wants bad news. Like if the job market was weak, if unemployment was spiking, then probably stocks would go up because then everyone would be like, oh, well, the Fed is going to stop raising interest rates, which is going to be a good thing for the stock market. Really weird times that we're living in, in my opinion. But anyways, that's that's why stocks fell back down is because the economy is actually strong. If we take a look at the U.S. unemployment rate, we can see that it is continuing to fall. And again, the U.S. unemployment rate continuing to fall is why stocks fell as well. Very interesting times.
but a good thing that we are seeing though is that the u.s job vacancies are coming down quite dramatically and this is also probably due to the fact that you know google and um meta even are not really hiring anymore they're putting on hiring freezes so you, job openings or job vacancies are starting to come down which is a good thing and um that, that is the fed's goal ultimately but kind of just crazy times that we're living in right now that's that's the major news that happened in the market that's why stocks were up at the beginning of the week and then fell pretty heavily into the end of the week so yeah that's kind of just like the really quick market update but uh what's going on with everyone how are how are you guys like how are your guys portfolios performing this week because i know that mine was pretty much bleeding out in the second second half of the week Oh, right here, we also have VJ who said, can we please review Cake? Yeah, we can take a look at Cake for sure. Let me just share my screen once more. Oh, wait, we got some more questions coming in. Did you take a look at AMD's preliminary third quarter release? Is it bad? Maybe a reason why the stock fell so hard. Yes, I actually did take a look at AMD's preliminary results. Basically, what happened is the company was was thinking they were going to do about 6.7 billion dollars in revenue for the third quarter um and that did not happen i think they said that they're going to do something like 5.4 billion i'm just going off the top of my head here but basically they're not going to meet their guidance at all it's not even going to be close it's probably going to be 15 to 20 percent below what they were previously expecting and the reason that this was negative news for the overall market is because amd's revenue isn't going to hit their projections mostly because of their they call it their client segment of the business their client segment of the business is like their area of the business where they put their their chips in laptops like dell hp and um i forget the third one but basically what that means is that there is not as high of a demand for personal computing right now and especially laptops so in my opinion the news wasn't actually that bad for amd as it was for companies like hp and dell because the news basically signaled that hp and dell are are seeing a, a serious lack of demand for their products right now and that is that's going over into amd's business as well um but amd's business like their data center business is growing incredibly strong uh, and it's just continuing to grow so i think that AMD is in a weird spot right now like in my opinion it is still kind of expensive i believe the price to free cash flows are about like 28 but um, it's a really interesting stock. It's really getting interesting here. So I'm going to have to do a little bit more deep diving on that one. All right. But going back up to the top, VJ asked if we can take a look at Cake. So yes, of course. Let's take a look here. I will share my screen and I'll try out this layout today. All right. So we're going to take a look at Cake here. The Cheesecake Factory. Right on. All right. So this stock has been around for a very long time. It IPO'd, well, we have data all the way back to 2000. So this stock has been on the market for over two decades. It's a $1.6 billion company, so like a mid cap. It's not a large cap, not really a small cap. It's probably getting closer to a small cap, but kind of in that mid cap range. Um, right away, Insight score is 3.6 out of 5. Let's just take a quick look at the Insights. Growth revenue isn't really growing. Operating income is growing, though. Net income is growing. Free cash flow is not growing. Book value is growing. So right away, revenue is not growing. That is something to note. Profitability, high gross margin. Operating margin is not high. Net margin is not high. And free cash flow margin is not high. So the gross margin is high, but the other profitability margins here are not very high at all. So it's not, it's not really converting a lot of the revenue into actual profits. ROIC is good. Okay, so no like major red flags right away interesting okay so this company is like growing its revenue like the trend of this business's revenue is up i don't know what happened right here but the trend of this business's revenue is up but it's like really slow revenue growth what about the cash flow and the trailing 12 months okay yeah so cash flow is down interesting what about the free cash flow free cash flow is also down this isn't this is a weird business man like what happens interesting yeah so in my opinion like this business looks like it's historically just not really grown that quickly 
And um, I mean, the revenue grew at 1% year over year. And as we saw over the past like decade, the revenue hasn't really grown that much at all. Like it's growing, but not quickly. And right now it's selling for a price to free cash flow of about 18. Um, that is kind of expensive, in my opinion, for a business that's not really growing revenue. The reason for that is because Adobe right now is selling for a price to free cash flow of 18. So again, you can go back to Cake, price to free cash flow of about 18. Go back to Adobe. Same it, Adobe is essentially selling at the same price in terms of free cash flows. But if we go to Adobe's financials, go over to the revenue. I mean, it's got a lot more revenue growth. And if we go over to the cash flow, it's got a lot more cash flow growth. So when I, it, when I take a look at Cake and I see like the company hasn't really grown over the past decade and it's selling for the same price ratio as a company like Adobe, um, personally, what I would do is ask myself, like, would I rather own Cake or would I rather own Adobe? I, again, I haven't really done like any analysis other than like the minute I just spent on Cake. But initially, that would be my thought is I would much rather own Adobe personally. So, um, yeah, Cake just looks interesting. I would, I would try to figure out what's going on with their cash flows. It looks like their cash flows are really declining right now. That could be due to inflation or something like that. But yeah, it just doesn't really look like a, a fast growing business at all. And that would be okay if it was selling at like a 10 price to free cash flow, but it's selling at an 18 price to free cash flow, which I think is on the higher end for a business that's not really growing. Stock Edo. Oh, hey, man, what's up? Stock Edo, by the way, I don't know if I'm actually saying this right. I think I'm saying Stock Edo right. But this guy is another great YouTuber. You should definitely go and check out his channel. Subscribe to him. He's got great content. I imagine this guy's going to be covering the AMD stuff. So if you're interested in the AMD news that came out, I can't guarantee this, but I can almost guarantee that Stock Edo is going to be covering that. All right. Um, thoughts on Thermo Fisher? Yeah, sure. Let's take a look. Let me share my screen again. Okay, Thermo Fisher, hey, Thermo Fisher Scientific. $205 billion company. Okay, this is massive. Okay, so let's take a look at the stock returns versus the SPY. It's massively outperformed the SPY over the past 20 and past 10 years, over the past five years as well. So basically, over all time frames, Thermo Fisher is heavily outperforming the SPY, which is very interesting. So what does this company actually do? I've actually never taken a look at this company. What does it do? Engages in the provision of analytical instruments, equipment, regiments, consumable software and services for research, analysis, discovery, and diagnostics. Has 130,000 full-time employees. So this is a massive, massive company. It looks like it's in like the... I want to say like the tech industry right here, we can see the financials are growing quite well year over year. Quarterly revenue looks like it is still uptrending. Let's take a look at our insights really quick. Profitability, it looks decently profitable. Good net margin, good operating margin, free cash flow margin is about 15%. Growth is 2.1 though. What's going on with growth? Revenue grew by 12%. Okay, so revenue is growing, gross profits growing. Operating income, net income, operating cash flow, and free cash flow are all decreasing, though. That's interesting. Okay, let's go take a deeper look. Income statement, revenue. So this business's revenue is at all-time high, $43 billion in revenue. Yeah, this is a massive company. Okay. Um, cash flow. Okay, so it looks like the cash flow is kind of topped out here right now. Looks like cash flow has actually kind of declined over the past year, which is what we saw in the insights. Free cash flow, same story. Free cash flow looks like it has declined over the past year as well. Okay, well, what is the price of this business? Price to free cash flow of 32. Hey, okay. Let's go and take a look at our free form tool. So immediately, I want to know why the cash flows are not continuing to grow with the revenue because if revenue is growing like this but you got free cash flow not growing like you can see here revenue is continuing to uptrend but the cash flow is downtrending and that was even the same story i believe for the operating cash flow so even before capex yeah operating cash flow is also going down which ultimately means operating cash flow margin should be declining and it is 
So I would want to know why the company's margins are declining like this. Because with the like with the revenue going up, I don't use price to sales in my own stock analysis. So if you're taking a look at this company's price to sales, it's probably better than the price to operating cash flow and everything. Yes, yeah, so the price to sales is like, you know, staying around the same level as it has over the past couple of years. But I like to take a look at the company's profits. But if we go, so if we go to price to operating cash flow, we're most likely going to see it. Oh, never mind. It's actually kind of staying consistent around this around this range. Op, price to operating cash flow is about 24 right now. The what's the 10 year average? 10 year average is about 20. So the stock is selling about 20 percent above its 10 year average. If we zoom into like 2014, the average is 22. So the stock is still selling about 10% above its average historical price to operating cash flow. So yeah, my main thing here would be like, why is the operating cash flow not growing with the revenue? Is that a short-term thing? Is that a long-term thing? And trying to figure that out because if this business can get its margins back and get that operating cash flow margin back up, then the operating cash flow will grow and um, that will ultimately compress the price to operating cash flow back down. So I'd really try to figure out what's going on with the margins. But this is a massive company, like absolutely massive. I don't think this company is going to go anywhere. And like the revenue is growing very nicely. Over the past decade, it's grown revenue at a compounded annual growth rate of 13.6%. And revenue is at an all-time high. So very attractive numbers in terms of growth right there. Like if this company was selling for a 20 price to free cash flow with this revenue growth, in my opinion, it would look very, very attractive. Although, again, I don't really know anything about this business, but just in terms of the numbers, it would look very attractive. So I'm probably going to add that one to my watch list, actually. And uh, hopefully we can we, we can answer some of those questions and hopefully see the stock come down a little bit more. All right. Um, we're getting some questions here about an update on bank stocks. Honestly, bank stocks kind of tanked over the past week here. I'll share my screen again once more. I should probably just continue sharing my screen. But anyways, if we go to like TD Bank, for example. TD Bank, um, one year. TD Bank topped out here at about $85 a share. It is now selling for about $60 a share. And the stock is down about 30% from its all-time highs at the beginning of this year. So the banking sector is really is really tanking right now. And it looks like over the past week, bank stocks have continued to go down. I mean, TD Bank ended the week down another 4%, which on a bank stock is pretty significant. So I actually don't really know why bank stocks are going down, especially if interest rates look like they are going to continue rising because bank stocks get a lot of the revenue. Like if we head over here to our financials tab, we can actually see on the income statement that banks get a lot of revenue from interest income. So they they essentially loan out money and depending on what interest rates are doing, they'll get more, how do I word this? They'll get more revenue for every dollar they lend out if interest rates are going up, which essentially means they're gonna make more money and their margins are going to increase if interest rates are rising. So theoretically, banks should actually benefit if interest rates are going up and we can actually see right here, let's take a look at the quarterly revenue for TD Bank. And we can see right here that as interest rates are increasing, TD Bank's interest income is increasing quite substantially as well. I mean, in the in the most recent quarter, in the second quarter of 2022, TD Bank did $7 billion in interest income. This isn't full on revenue. This is just their interest income or their interest revenue. And it's literally at a 10 year high. Actually, let's zoom out for 20 years. Yeah, their interest income is hitting an all-time high. So the that's what I mean is banks actually benefit from rising interest rates. So if interest rates are going to continue rising, then banks should continue making more money. I believe Bank of America actually said for every 1% that interest rates rise, they make another $6 billion in profit. That is no joke. That's a lot of money that these banks make off um, rising interest rates. So personally... Um, not a financial advisor, but personally, I have been dollar cost averaging banks, especially while they continue coming down, just because their interest income is going to continue rising, in my opinion. And I mean, banks are they pay great dividends. And if we head over to our dividends tab right here, 
I mean, we can see that TD Bank, for example, has grown its dividend like so consistently and so nicely over the years. And I think that banks are just going to continue increasing their dividends over the long term. So for like dividend income and for dividend growth income, personally, I think banks are just awesome. And um, yeah, I'm definitely dollar cost averaging banks right now. Also, like take a look at this. If we take a look at TD Bank's returns, total returns, including the dividend payments over the past 20 years, this stock has returned about 600. Even in the dip that it's in, the 30% dip that it's in, it's returned about 647%, including the dividends over the past 20 years. If you take a look at Royal Bank, this is even more insane. Royal Bank over the past 20 years has returned, what is that? 778%. That's insane, including the dividends. And Royal Bank is the same story. They just continue increasing their dividends. And I think that banks are going to continue increasing their dividends, especially in this high interest rate environment. I'm already on Royal Bank. What am I doing? But also, if we compare Royal Bank's returns to the SPY over the past 20 years, like people, at least on my own personal YouTube channel, I've noticed that people don't really like bank stocks. Like whenever I talk about them, people don't really seem to get excited. But look at the returns of Royal Bank over the past 20 years, 460% versus the SPY's 220%. I get excited about that. And then we saw the, the total returns, including the dividends, were almost 800%. Like, I don't know, man. I think banks are solid, um, depending on the bank. And in this high interest rate environment with interest rates rising, I think that banks' fundamentals could improve and increase. So, well, I mean, time will tell, you know, time will tell. But when I see banks in a 30% correction like that, I, I do like to dollar cost average and continue building my position in them. But that's just my opinion. Okay, it's stock. It's like avocado. First, so it's stock auto, like avocado. Got it. <laughs> awesome. Um, stock auto also says they will be covering AMD in the next video. So if you want to go and get an update on AMD, make sure to go and subscribe to Stock Auto. And uh, they're they're very good at covering the the semiconductor sector. So definitely go and give, give them a, a subscribe and a watch. Okay. Portfolio has been bleeding, but the rally was nice. I agree. <laughs> at the start of the week, what's interesting though, for me at least, is like, it's nice to see a rally happen. And like, I do get kind of excited. I'm like, oh yeah, my portfolio is up. But at the same time, there's also an element of me that's like, dang, <laughs> because I like to dollar cost average, right? So when there is a rally happening and stocks are up like 6%, I do get kind of bitter because I'm like, okay, well, now Google isn't as cheap. You know, like, okay, well, now Royal Bank isn't as cheap. And then it kind of also makes me sad. <laughs> so yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing going on. All right, we got another comment from VJ right here. GSY usually gives loans to those who cannot get approval from banks. Don't you think defaulters will, or sorry, yeah, defaulters will increase during a recession? Okay, so this is kind of interesting. GSY, by the way, for those of you who don't know, is Go Easy, and Go Easy. I own the stock. Full disclosure, um, it's just an incredible company, in my opinion. They make so much money off their loans, and so the company has lived through the stock market crash of 2000 when the tech bubble popped and they've also lived through the great recession and through both periods what we actually saw was hold it let me let me get my thoughts here really quick so i should back up first and say that go easy their loans are typically to the middle class like the the blue collar workers and typically in recessions what we have, what we've actually seen is blue collar workers don't have as much defaults as white collar workers and blue collar workers actually are more able to pay off all of their loans and continue making their interest payments um what i would recommend if you are invested in gsy or you're interested in the stock is just go and take a look at their most recent investor presentation because they cover all of this they basically say that their defaults should not increase and their loans are actually quite stable and um I mean, the business in their most recent financial reporting increased their guidance for essentially all metrics. They said that their business is seeing so much growth right now, so much demand 
that they've increased their one-year guidance and their four-year guidance. And um, insiders are continuing to buy the stock. So I think GoEasy is going to be fine. Um, it's one of the stocks that I hold. Let me just share my screen and I'll show you guys some, some interesting things about this business. Okay, so if we go to gsy.to, go easy. It's, it's like a mid cap stock, okay? It's been very volatile over the recent few years. It's got a dividend yield of 3.42% right now. If we go and take a look at the dividends though, this stock has been growing its dividends like crazy over the past decade. So in 2013, it was paying a dividend per share of about 34 cents. Now it's paying a dividend of $2.89. So it's almost 10 X its dividend over the past 10 years. And if you take a look at the historical yield on cost, if you were buying this stock in like 2011, your dividend yield on cost right now would be about 45%. That is how quickly the company is growing its dividend. And I just think the fundamentals of this business are still sound and they're increasing their um, their guidance essentially. And we can also see that the company is setting in a record amount of revenue in their most recent quarter. So, I mean, the business is firing on all cylinders. They're growing. It looks like there is a lot of demand for their services right now. And I think the company's defaults are, what's interesting is the company's defaults on their loans are actually going down right now because one of the company's strategy is to increase their loan, their loan book, like the quality of their loans. So, yeah, I mean, their default rate is actually declining right now, and it looks like it's going to continue declining. So I'm not, I'm honestly not really too concerned about this business, and I think it's just going to continue growing over the long term, at least in my own opinion. Okay, let's continue on. Um, I think we looked at love last week. Okay, we got a question right here. I'm sorry if I'm missing questions too. Um, the screen I'm on right here, it like when people write comments, the it just kind of shifts up. So I'm sorry if I miss some. Dominic right here asks, hi, Daniel, you talked about a screener that is in development. Since Jake and Nick are not here and they are not here to stop you, I suggest that you show it to us like you did with the portfolio. <laughs> okay, so for reference, th thank you, Dominic, for this. So for reference, everyone, Jake and Nick are the engineers building stock unlock and they don't like me showing off, you know, the features that we're working on because who knows, but me, when they're not here, I like to show them off. So yes, Dominic, Jake and Nick, if you're watching this again, just look away, please look away. You're not here to stop me. So let's do it. I'm going to share my screen. So I got to give a little bit of a disclaimer here though, or a disclosure. This is still in development, very much so, okay? We are improving the screener every single day. It's getting a lot better, but it's not there yet. So what I'm going to show you is not going to be the final product at all, but it is still very exciting that we have a screener. And it's not, it's not designed, it's not styled or anything like that yet. So just keep that in mind, okay? It's very rough still. But yeah, this is the stock screener. So what we do is we've taken essentially this all the stocks on stock unlock we have about 130,000 stocks around the globe and we we use our stock unlock insights to give them a general score we call it a stock unlock general score and then the screener will show you the top stocks on stock unlock like this the top stocks that we have rated here now we do have some issues still right here like this is what i mean this is why the the engineers will probably get mad at me for doing this but we have some stocks here like this one, Top Golf, Top Golf Callaway, for example, where it only has one segment where it's like the analyst gave it a five out of five. And then we 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 show this as a five stock, right? It's like the top rated stock. So we're working on filtering out these businesses right here that don't have a lot of data on them. And then we will not show them. But you can see right here, in mode has a score of 4.9. That's like right at the top. And what I've noticed is a lot of the top stocks right now are companies in the energy sector like oil and gas because oil and gas companies like their fine sorry their fundamentals and their financials actually are growing so much over the past year with the rising oil prices so a lot of energy stocks are the top stocks here on our insight screener so what we're doing or what we're going to do is build in additional filters so for example if i don't want to see energy stocks then i can just filter all of those out in the screener here 
and um, then I won't see any energy stocks. I'll just see whatever whatever um, industry that I want to see. If I want to see, you know, technology, for example, then we will filter out only the technology stocks. And then we will also be able to add in like market caps. So if you want to see tech stocks with the best insight score between a market cap of like 100 million to a billion, if you're someone who likes to invest in smaller cap companies, that's going to be an option with the screener. And um, it's, it's just going to be great. Like we're going to build this out probably over the next month, continue iterating on it and just making it better and better, but it's working. And I have found some interesting stocks with this screener so far. Also, you can like, if you want to see the stocks with the best growth, for example, you can click this right here and boom, now you can see the stocks with the best growth. And um, yeah, it's a lot of like resource companies, um, mineral companies right now. I haven't seen this company actually yet, Inventronics, um, Evergreen Gaming. Oh, Pfizer right there. But yeah, this is what it is right now. It's cool, but it's not what we want yet. It's not fully complete. And uh, we're working on it really hard. And as I said, it literally is improving every single day. So hopefully this will be out within the next month and we can uh, we can all start playing around with the screener. It's going to be awesome. Like, I am so excited for this. <laughs> I cannot wait for it to be done. But yeah, thank you for asking about that too. Like, the screener is one of the most requested features that we have ever gotten to build outside of the portfolio tracker as well. And the portfolio tracker is in beta testing right now. It's it's making a lot of progress too. We're making it super, like it, it's gonna be one of the, if not the best portfolio tracker on the internet, it's gonna be one of the best ones. And then we're also building the screener right now at the same time. So there is a lot, and I mean a lot going on behind the scenes. And I think stock unlock within like the next, I would say within the next six weeks is going to be quite a, quite a great platform <laughs> we're we're adding in those last things that we need it yeah it's, it's an exciting time all right let's take a look oh we're getting a lot of comments coming in um kingdom of finance i'm going all in on ttcf by the way i'm not gonna laugh i'm not gonna laugh yeah you if you watch my main channel you know my opinion <laughs> all right all right, I'm trying to find some comments. Glad you're doing live. It's been a heck of a year. I agree. Okay, this is a good question right here. Hi, Daniel. Is there any reason you invested in BIP instead of the Canadian equivalent BIP.UN in your model portfolio? Yes. So I invested in BIP.UN in my own personal portfolio last year. And just the way, cause B I I'm not a tax guy. So this is really complicated for me. And I just send all of my taxes out to a tax professional, but essentially what I gathered was that BIP.UN is a partnership. And with a partnership, you have to file something called like a K one form. These forms are a nightmare for tax accountants and tax professionals. So I got charged. I think it was something like $450 on the dividends that I received from BIP.UN for my tax professional to fill out that K-1 form. So basically, the dividends that I received from BIP.UN went away <laughs> from, you know, I had to go and pay my tax professional to file the dividends, and that ate basically 100% of my dividend profits from BIP.UN. So... In my model portfolio that I made on my, my main channel, I chose BIP because BIP is not structured in the same way as BIP.UN, so I will not have to pay those, those K-1 taxes, essentially, or those my tax accountant to file the K-1 form. Also, if you are um, invested in BIP.UN and you're looking for an alternative, what Brookfield did... So they have BIP, which is the American ticker, and then they have BIP.UN, which is the ticker that we're talking about right now. If you own BIP.UN, you will have that K-1 tax form, which if you use a tax account, it's going to cost you more money. So what BIP did is they made BIPC, which is this right here. BIPC is structured as a corporation, which means that you can avoid the K-1 tax filing if you own BIPC.TO, which it, again is the corporation, it basically the goal of this stock is to mimic the exact performance of BIP 
it's very confusing. Brookfield in general is just really confusing to understand. So to put it simply, BIPC.TO will allow you to avoid those complicated taxes with BIP.UN. Here's the catch though. Everyone knows this. Well, not everyone, but a lot of major investors know this. So there is a premium on the BIPC.TO shares, which really sucks. For example, right here, we can see the dividend yield on BIPC.TO. The corporation is 3.73%. If we go over to BIP, dividend yield is 4.18%. Again, these companies are supposed to be mimicking each other 100% totally, but in reality, that does not happen because people know that by, I'm looking at the wrong stock right now. I need BIP.UN. Still the same thing, 4.17. So people know that they got to pay more complicated taxes essentially on these shares right here. So there is a lower demand for them. And since the, there's a lower demand for them, the dividend yield is actually higher. And then if you go over to BIPC once again, there is a higher demand for BIPC.TO shares. So the dividend yield is lower because people price the stock higher just to avoid the complicated taxes. So there's a catch 22 there. This company, you don't have to pay those complicated taxes, but people know that and it's priced higher and you don't get as much of a dividend yield. So there's a trade-off. And um, that's the reason why I just put BIP in my, in my uh, mock portfolio. I hope that answered the question, by the way. Okay, um, let's continue on. Okay, financial forecaster. I've been following you for a while and I have been very curious about your thoughts on well health as a mid cap Canadian play. I think I took a look at the stock a long time ago. Let's go and take a look once again. So well health, you say. Am I, am I typing that right? Well health? Well health. Well health. I don't know why this isn't popping up. Okay, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with the ticker here. Do you know what the ticker is? Um, I'll move on from this one until we get a ticker because I don't know if the name there is working. Okay, Nathan Grimard asks, do you think a young investor should focus on small or mid-cap stocks since they can grow faster? Won't big and mega caps, most of the SPY will stagnate eventually. Um, I can't really give advice on what anyone should do in their portfolio. Personally, I like small and mid-cap stocks. How do I word this right now? The reason I like them right now, I don't know if this is going to stay the same forever, but the reason I like small and mid-cap stocks right now is because I think they're super cheap. That's why in my own portfolio, I've been more happy to buy small and mid-cap stocks because there are very fundamentally sound businesses. Like, think about this. A mid-cap stock will be like a $2 billion company. Okay, so on the stock market, a $2 billion company is very small, right? I mean, when you compare that to like Apple, $2 trillion. So... A mid-cap stock may be worth $2 billion, which is small relative to the stock market. But when you think about that in the real world, okay, like, you know, go outside, leave your computer, think about a $2 billion company. In the real world, a $2 billion company is a pretty significant company. It's actually quite large. So I think that there are fundamentally sound businesses in the mid-cap, small-cap range on the stock market, again, that are that have very strong fundamentals. And right now, it seems like a lot of people or the stock market in general, the consensus is small cap stocks are risky. So small cap prices have come down a lot. And since the prices have come down a lot, I think that it's a great time to buy fundamentally sound small cap companies. I don't know if this is going to remain the same forever. I don't know if small caps are going to get super expensive in like a decade. So I don't want to give a blanket statement and say like, I think small cap stocks are the best thing to own all the time because I don't actually think that will be true. I think that there could be a time where small caps get super expensive and then it would be risky to buy them. So I try to adapt to what the situation is. I try to just look for value all the time. And right now I do think that there is a lot of value in small caps. 
let me actually share my screen here. And actually, I'm going to find the link before I share my screen. I'm just going to find this, and I'll show you exactly what I mean. S&P 500 trailing price to earnings ratios. Is this the right one? Is this the right one? No, it's not. I wish I had this, but it's OK. I will find it for everyone. What the heck? Of course, when I'm doing a live stream, I can't find the data I'm looking for, right? Oh, just kidding. Found it. OK, I will share my screen now. OK, over here. I just want to show you exactly what my thinking is here. OK. So by the way, this is Yardini Research. They put out a weekly report on a bunch of different fundamentals about the market. Yardini Research, seriously, an absolutely fantastic resource. And I, I probably check them at least once every week or once every two weeks because they put out graphs like this and they're updated basically in real time. It's incredible. Anyways, so right here, we can see the S&P 600 small cap stocks. Okay, so this is like the small cap index. Right now has a forward price to earnings ratio of 10.9, which is all the way down here. And if I just do a screenshot really quick like this, what we can do, I can use a line. And we can just draw from about right here out to 10.7. And we can see that the only times in history where small caps have been this cheap is right here in 2020 and right here in the in the stock market crash of 2008 during the Great Recession. So over the past about 23 years, there has only been two times where small caps have been this cheap. So I think that there is a lot of value in the small cap land right now. And that's why I am focusing on small caps. And it's almost like not even, I'm not even doing it like consciously. I just always look for value. And that's just where I'm finding the most value right now. Now, again, I don't know if this is going to last forever because take a look at what happened in 2021. Small cap forward price to earnings ratios got all the way up here to something like 27. And that is even higher than the, than the tech bubble. So right here in 2021, Small caps got super expensive. I don't know if this is going to happen again. If it does, then I will probably sell my small caps just on a value basis, and I would not continue adding to them. But right now, small caps look quite cheap. So that is why I am finding value there. And I hope that kind of makes sense. Okay. Afgorilla says... Is stock unlock an app? How much is it per month? Um, it's a web app. We do it does work on the mobile phone, but we don't have a mobile app like on the app store or anything like that. And it is six ninety nine US a month. But if you pay for a full year, you save fifteen percent. So a lot of our users actually just pay for the full year to save that fifteen percent and lock in the price. We don't have any plans right now on raising the price. Like full disclosure, we that, like that is not even a conversation we're having internally at all. But I mean, over the long term, I do imagine that our price will increase. I just don't know when or how much. And don't worry about that anytime soon. And if we do increase our price, we will make it very, 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 very clear. You will know well ahead of time. And we'll give you the option to like lock in a year if you want to lock in a price. So we'll be very upfront about that. Um, thanks for showing us the screener. Yeah, no problem, Dominic. Thanks for asking about it. <laughs> I, I, I like to do that. When Jake's not here, I like to do that. <laughs> Okay, um, will stock unlock trap crypto? Uh, no, I don't think so. I I don't think so. Personally, I uh, yeah, we have no plans on doing that, at least. Um, please check out CFP. Really want to know what you think. It has such a low price to earnings ratio. Okay, sure, let's do it. CFP, you say. I also want to see well health. I want to know what happened with that ticker. Very interesting to me. Maybe we can go. I'm going to, you know what? I'm just going to type in well. I'm going to do well.to. There it is. There was a space. There was a freaking space. Freaking amateur hour. Okay. Over here on my part. Okay. 
We'll get back to that one, though. Let's take a look at CFP. That is not the right ticker. CF. Is it CFP.to? Are you talking about Canfor? I got to go back here. Are you talking about Canfor? I'm going to imagine you're talking about Canfor. Okay. I'm going to imagine you're talking about Canfor because it does have a low price to earnings ratio of 2.2 and a price to free cash flow of 2.4. So, I mean, a free cash flow yield of 41%, okay? Now, right away, I actually know about this stock. I'm not like super well-versed in the stock, but my dad owns this stock, and my dad was like a super bull on this stock, so I, yeah. Anyways, this stock is very cyclical. What they do is they essentially, they're a lumber company, like a forestry company. They, they essentially, <clears throat> make and sell lumber. So when the lumber prices are high, this company makes a, a lot of money. When lumber prices are low, they don't make nearly as much money. That's why you can kind of see right here, it's got a very cyclical stock price. I imagine this, if you graphed lumber prices, it would probably mimic this company's stock price quite significantly. If we also take a look at this company's financials um, in the trailing 12 months, in the trailing 12 months, this company's revenue has actually gone up quite significantly. But you can see like right here from 2005 to 2008, the revenue got cut in half. And then it started coming back up. And then the revenue kind of fell right here from 2018 to 2020. And then lumber prices went absolutely insane. And this company made so much dang money. If we also take a look at the cash flow, I imagine they made a record amount of money in 2021, 2022. Yeah. So you can see they made a record amount of money here in 2021 at $2.18 billion. But now the their profits are starting to come back down um, because lumber prices have come back down. So the reason I don't own this stock, even though it's really cheap, is because I have no idea what lumber prices are going to do in the future. And I don't know how that will affect this company's business. And um, I don't I just personally don't like stocks that depend so much on commodity prices and like what commodity prices are doing, because I don't know what commodity prices are going to do. And that makes me very uncomfortable. This is also why I don't really invest in um, <clears throat> oil companies because I, I just think they're a little bit more unpredictable. They're a little bit more cyclical. I don't know what area of the cycle I'm buying. And in, for me, these companies are out of my circle of competence. So I don't really look at them that much. However, the company does look cheap. I mean, price to free cash flow of two, right? It's a $2 billion company right here. $2.4 billion company. And if you go to the cash flow, they made $1 billion in free cash flow in the trailing 12 months. But also you can see that the cash flow is significantly dropping right now. And it looks like throughout history, they've produced positive free cash flow, then negative free cash flow, then positive free cash flow. Then it goes down to like no cash flow, then positive cash flow. So it's just a very cyclical business in my opinion. And I don't know what it's going to do in the future. Um, now we can talk about well.to, well health technologies. So this was like a Canadian stock that was a darling during the whole situation that we were in over the past two years. I'm not allowed to say it on YouTube because YouTube does not like that when we talk about it. So I cannot say the actual name, but we all know what happened over the past two years. Um, so yeah, this stock was worth like 11 cents in 2017. All right. Then it went all the way up here. I'm going to zoom in. It went up. 8,000, literally like 8,000% over four years, okay? It went up all the way to $9 a share. This company, oh man, I took a look at it. Let's just take a look at the insights. So profitability, gross margin, 53%. Operating margin is low. Net margin is negative. Free cash flow margin is 10%, though. Growth revenue grew by 312%. I'll zoom in a little bit. Gross profits increased by 385%. Operating income, 206%. Operating cash flow increasing by thousands of percent, free cash flow increasing by thousands of percent. So when you take a look at the growth of this business, it looks quite good. Um, financial health, 1.6 though. Current ratio is about one. Intangibles as a percent of total assets is 81%. Whenever I see high intangible assets as a percent of total assets, basically what that tells me is the company likes to acquire. Because intangible assets include, well, intangible assets and goodwill. So if the company has a lot of intangible assets, basically what that means is they have a lot of goodwill. Goodwill comes on the balance sheet when a company does acquisitions. So this right here 
80% of the company's total assets are intangible assets, which again, most likely means that they are doing acquisitions. Now we can also see that the shares increased by about 15% over the past year, which is a lot of dilution. Companies usually dilute when they do acquisitions. So these two factors right here coupled together, tell me the company most likely is doing a lot of acquiring because it's diluting shareholders and it has a lot of goodwill. Debt to EBITDA ratio is also 5.3, which is quite high, which means that they do have quite a bit of debt. So the company looks like it's growing strong. It's probably growing from acquisitions and those acquisitions have caused the company to have not a very strong balance sheet. And also we can see that it's not very profitable. So just by taking a look at our insights, that's kind of the idea that I'm getting right here. Let's take a look at the revenue. So the revenue growth is like ridiculous, okay? Like revenue has grown like very, very, very strong. Cost of revenue, or sorry, I want to take a look at gross profits. Gross profits are also growing very strong. Operating income though, operating income is not really growing strong and net income is negative. So that is definitely something to watch out for. And boom, there you go. Right here, if we take a look at the shares, the shares outstanding were about 12 million in 2017. Now they're about 216 million. So in four years, this company's share count has basically 20 X. That is, that is a lot of dilution. That is a lot and a lot and a lot and a lot and a lot of dilution. That is a major red flag for me. Cash from operating activities, however, is increasing $50 million in operating cash flow. Their CapEx is low, which is only 4 million, which means that they got a lot of free cash flow coming in of about $44 million in the trailing 12 months, about $45 million in free cash flow in the trailing 12 months. Price to free cash flow now of about 15. So basically, a price to free cash flow of like 15, I think, is not very expensive. But there's a major, major red flag in this business for me, which is simply just the share count increasing because how this company grows is it dilutes and it acquires. And I mean, from 2017, let me zoom in on this because from 2017 to today, this company's share count has grown at a compounded annual growth rate of 79%. Okay. That is big. <laughs> that is really big. Man, oh man, oh man, oh man, oh man, man, man. Okay, market cap versus stock price. Okay, so this stock is now selling for a share price of $3. Last time it was selling for a share price of $3. I had a market cap of that. Um, yeah. So this is what dilution does. This is why I'm looking at this chart. I, I should explain this. So when you increase the share count market cap is share count times stock price equals market cap market cap is the actual price you're paying for the business so what that means is when a business increases its share count it increases its market cap without increasing share price so i'll show you what i mean by that because it is kind of confusing so right here we can see that well health is trading for a stock price i'll zoom in again a stock price of about three dollars right now and the market cap is about 700 million. Okay, so stock price, $3, market cap, 700 million. If we go back in history, we can see that right here in 2020, the stock was trading again at about $3, $3.10, and the market cap was 400 million. So in 2020, the stock price was the same, but the market cap was almost half of what it is today. Again, we can see right here, stock price, $3, market cap, 700 million. This is what dilution does. It it makes the stock look cheap because I mean, if we take out market cap, you may be looking at the stock price right now. Oh, it's at $3. The last time it was at $3 was in 2020. So the stock has lost about two years of stock price appreciation. Well, okay, let's take a look at just the market cap now and not the stock price because the market cap is at 700 million. And the last time the stock was at 700 million was actually about right here. You know, like, so it's important to pay attention to the market cap and the shares outstanding growing like this significantly increase the market cap without increasing the share price. So honestly, <clears throat> I know this company is growing a lot, but I could not buy a stock personally. That's diluting an average of 78% a year. It's just too much. It's way too much for me. So yeah, that's my opinion on well, I guess.
whoa, I filled up my coffee mug way too much. I almost just spilled. Holy. Okay. I'm sorry if I'm lost in comments right here. Um, can you please analyze that? Hi, Aaron. I do like... Aaron from India. Nice. Hey, Aaron. Wow. Okay, Aaron. I'm sorry I haven't read your full comment yet, but could you give us insights on what you think about the Indian economy? Like, I, based on all the numbers that I see, I see India growing super quick and like experiencing a technological a technology revolution. So if you could give us your insights being from India, that would be awesome. Like, I would love to hear them. But anyways, you say... I do like your analysis for my U.S. stock investment, but I am doing only ETF VOO. Sometimes I do cover Indian stocks to learn the method. So it sounds like you are an index investor, um, or sorry, an ETF investor. I don't, I don't own any ETFs right now. Um, so yeah, I I really really like doing my own stock analysis and buying my own single stocks and building my own portfolio. So. Yeah. Unfortunately, I can't really comment on ETFs because I don't know a lot about ETFs. Like you're saying VOO right here. I don't actually even know what that is off the top of my head. So yeah, um, I'm sorry. I can't really answer your questions about ETFs. Um, Daniel actually owns Indian bank stock, I believe. Yes, I do. I own HDFC bank. I can share my screen and show you guys HDFC bank, which is also known as HDB. Okay, so this is HDB right here. Right away, if we compare the stock's return versus the SPY, um, this stock is up 4,000, basically 4,000% 4, over the past 20 years. And uh, the SPY is up about 240%. So it has massively, massively, massively outperformed the SPY. And this bank right here, it is the largest private commercial bank in India. India as I just said earlier on, is experiencing like this technology boom, this technology revolution. And the economy of India is projected to become the second largest economy in the world. It's actually projected to pass the US, I believe, within like the next 30 years. Like India is just growing so freaking quickly. And this bank right here is the largest private sector bank in India. So basically, this is my thinking. HDB is like the JP Morgan of India. India is growing so quickly, so I think that HDB will continue growing with the overall economy of India. If we head over to our insights right here, like take a look at this. For our bank-specific insights, it's got a 4.9, almost a perfect 5. Deposits are growing 20% year over year. Interest income 14%, non-interest income 8%. Loans are increasing 21%. Tangible book value is increasing, and the efficiency ratio is incredible. This is like the most efficient bank I've ever seen on stock unlock. Also, revenue is growing at 12%, net income 21%, book value is 18%, tangible book value 18%. For a bank, these are ridiculous growth rates, okay? Like, actually ridiculous. And if we go to the income statement and go to the yearly um, revenue growth, I mean, this company has grown its revenue. I think it's grown its revenue. Like, the numbers are just bonkers. I think the revenue growth was something like 1,000x over the past 20 years. Like, literally 1,000x revenue for a bank like let's go and take a look at our freeform tool here and when i stream it just like wrecks my internet so it's going to take a minute okay revenue growth over the past 20 let's go over the past oh yeah we got this weird thing going on because they don't report every quarter or they didn't historically so we're going to take a look at the past decade i think that's more relevant and we're going to compare this to jp morgan Let me compare HDB's revenue versus JP Morgan. HDB has grown its revenue over the past decade at a compounded annual growth rate of 19% versus JP Morgan's 2.3%. This is HDB is like a growth stock, okay? That is a very fast compounded annual growth rate. And if we even take a look at net income or earnings, this is the same story. HDB has grown net income at a 20% compounded annual growth rate over the past decade, JP Morgan about 9%. So this bank is growing more than twice as quick. And even the book value 
um, book value, shareholder equity right there, has grown at 24% a year versus JP Morgan's 3.8%. Like HDB is the fastest growing bank I have ever found on stock on lock. And I think that it just has such a long runway for continued growth because the overall Indian economy is growing so quickly. Now, with that being said, HDB does sell at quite the premium to JP Morgan. It has a price to earnings ratio right now of 20.4. JP Morgan has a price to earnings ratio of eight. So HDB does sell at a significant premium to JP Morgan. And um, yeah, it's just because it's growing a lot more quickly. We actually added in a new metric to stock on the lock over the past week, which is the price to earnings ratio on cost. And I have not taken a look at this. Okay, so here, here's something super interesting, okay? So we just saw that HDB sells at a higher price to earnings ratio than JP Morgan. I wasn't planning on talking about this. This is, I'm still grasping my head around this concept, okay? But in a very real way, growth equals value. Warren Buffett has actually said this before. So typically value investing like the general market consensus on value investing is like buying stocks with low price to earnings ratios, low price to free cash flows. Like if a stock has a 25 PE, not a value investment, that is what people think, right? Warren Buffett himself has actually said that this thinking is wrong. And value investing is all about thinking about what are you paying for the business today versus what the business can generate for you in profits in the future. That is what value investing is. So if you're paying a 25 price to earnings ratio for a business today, it could be a value investment if the business can grow quickly over the next decade. Because what will happen is, okay, you're paying a price to earnings ratio of 25 today, but as the business's earnings grow, the price to earnings ratio that you paid, your price to earnings ratio on cost goes down and down and down and down as the business expands. That is exactly what we're taking a look at right here is the price to earnings ratio on cost. So for example, Right here in 2014, if we were buying JP Morgan or HDB, we would have a price to earnings ratio on those shares today of 5.7 because the companies have grown their earnings over the past eight years. And as the companies have grown their earnings, our price to earnings ratio on cost goes down. So HDB has always had a higher price to earnings ratio than JP Morgan, right? But the company is growing a lot faster. As we take a look through history right here, we can actually see that HDB, if you were buying it in 2005, your price to earnings ratio on cost would be point, sorry, 0 0.44 versus JP Morgan's 3.12. So since HDB has grown its earnings much more rapidly than JP Morgan, back in 2005, your price to earnings ratio on cost would be like a tenth, almost a tenth of JP Morgan's price to earnings ratio on cost. So when I take a look at this and I take a look at, okay, well, HDB has always sold at a higher price to earnings ratio. Yeah, but this company has grown its earnings so quickly that it's actually been a better investment than JP Morgan. And when you take a look back in history, I would argue that HDB has been a much, much, much better value investment than JP Morgan because it's grown its earnings so quickly that has lowered the price to earnings ratio on cost massively to point four. That's a lot to take in. I don't know if I explained that well. I'm still working on how I explain the price to earnings ratio on cost, but I want to do a video here on the stock unlock YouTube channel going over why growth is value. There is a point where, you know, it's, it's too expensive and you're taking on too much risk, but there is also a point where, yeah, a stock may be selling for a 25 price to a free cash flow or whatever, but if that business can grow, then it actually is a value investment. And that's what we're seeing right here with HDB versus JP Morgan, in my own opinion. So yeah, the stock is more expensive today. It's got that higher price to earnings ratio, but I think the business is going to grow more rapidly and it's going to continue dropping the price to earnings ratio on cost. Um, another way to think about this, I wasn't even planning on talking about this today, but um, we're going to do it. So another way to think about this is Adobe. Adobe's price to free cash flow over the past decade has like it's it's consistently sold at a price to free cash flow of like 30. OK, it's always been an expensive stock, except for right now, because it's selling for a price to free cash flow of like 18, which is awesome. But if you take a look at Adobe's price to free cash flow on cost you can see that over time, like if you were buying the stock in 2003, you have a price to free cash flow on cost of 1.12. 
because this business has grown its free cash flow so much. I mean, even back here, if you were buying the stock in, if you're buying the stock in like 2014, your price to free cash flow on cost now is only five. So yeah, the stock is basically always selling for a price to free cash flow of 30, but it's also growing its cash flows so quickly. And it, that lowers the free cash price to free cash flow that you paid on cost. Um, I really hope this is all making sense. But that is why I strongly believe that growth equals value in the market. And I believe that Warren Buffett also has said that. Because I mean, just take a look at Adobe's free cash flow growth. And as companies grow their free cash flow, it lowers the price you've actually paid. So this is a really cool metric that we added last week is the price to free cash flow and price to earnings on cost. And basically the reason we added these metrics in is because I want to make a full on dedicated video that explains this thinking very well and articulates the thought process very well. Um, and just really tries to hammer the point that growth is value to an extent. So I don't even know how I got on that tangent, man, but it happened. <laughs> I hope that all made sense. Okay. Um, so we have some comments here about India because I asked about India. Kingdom of Finance says, I'm Indian as well. The Indian economy is going to be nuts. Hindustan Unilever is a beast. I am sorry if I just butchered the pronunciation there. <laughs> but I agree, man. I agree. I think people are sleeping on India, and I am not. I am happily investing in India, and I think it's going to be a beast over the over the coming decades. It's like it's almost like a no-brainer investment for me, but not financial advice. That's just me. Daniel, I am also from India. And did drop you guys an email today. India is super bullish. Oh, you I'm sorry if we didn't respond to your email. Um, the the guys are out. Jake usually handles all the emails. He's like our customer support guy. Um, he's out, so I will do my best to get back to your email today. Um, India is super bullish. You are right, estimating growth potential. It has all the positives of a growing economy. Yeah, I would agree. Um, yeah, so it looks like people from India are also bullish on India, which is a good thing, in my opinion. Dave Lunn, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, says, hey, Daniel, thanks for all your hard work and the love of investing. I've been following for a long time now. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, I mean, I can't explain it. I, I can't explain it. Like, I just love investing. <laughs> like, this is what I do for fun. Like, when I'm bored, and when I'm just like laying in bed at night, I, I analyze stocks. Like, I don't know why I find it so fun. But it's fun for me. Numbers make sense to me. And um, they always have. And I just... Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad. I'm just glad that my nerdiness for stocks can be a benefit to other people. Um, not able to look up the price to free cash flow on cost. Is it released to us? It should be released. So if you're in the free form tool, you have to search, type in, type in P slash F C F. I believe. Let me just go and make sure on my screen. P F C F cost. Yeah, so type in that and it should pop up. If you type in price to free cash flow like this, I'm putting comments in the thing here. If you type that, it will not show up. It's probably a bug that we should fix or not a bug, but like a miss on our part. But yeah, you, you have to type in P slash V F C F. I don't know why I can't talk right now. Okay, Brandon said, th whoa. Brandon said thoughts on the MJ sector with Biden legalizing pardoning federal offense. Yeah. So my thoughts on the cannabis, I can't say the actual word for the M word because that's bad on YouTube. Um, so my train of thought just got lost. I'm sorry. Cannabis. Yes. My thoughts on cannabis are I'm holding. Okay. I think as I've always said on my main channel, it's just a matter of time before the U S legalizes cannabis federally. I'm holding my stocks, True Leaf and Green Thumb Industries, because they're the most profitable cannabis companies. And those companies, I believe, are going to make it um, 
to when the U.S. finally does legalize cannabis. I think that the Joe Biden news is amazing for the entire sector. I actually think that it's arguably the most important news that has ever come out for the cannabis sector ever. Um, and it just it confirms my confidence in my long term investment thesis that this is it's a it's a wave that's happening. It's going to happen. And at this point, I personally believe it's inevitable. Um, so I'm happily holding my cannabis stocks. Well, maybe not happily. I mean, it sucks to see them down like 60%. But I, as I've always said, I'm invested in this industry for the next decade. And there is nothing that has changed my investment thesis. If anything, the news only has strengthened my investment thesis and built conviction. So that's kind of what I think. Um, Nathan says, Daniel, you said you don't have ETFs, but how are you buying Indian stocks? Only the ones that trade on US exchanges instead of an Indian ETF. Yeah. So HDB. HDB is a US ticker. It trades in US currency and it's uh it's India's largest private bank. So I buy the ticker HDB and um that's how I invest in Indian stocks. There's also IBN. I own IBN, it's another major Indian bank. Basically, I own 50%. If, if we're talking about just Indian stocks right now, I personally own 50% HDB, 50% IBN, <clears throat> because I think both banks are awesome. Signed up for Stock Unlock. Thank you so much. No, thank you. <laughs> really appreciate it. We're working. Man, it is unbelievable how hard we're working on this platform. It's nuts. Cancelled my Fintel as it gave a lot of information, but Stock Unlock displays it in a much better format to understand. Love to hear that. So I am the guy working with designers to design Stock Unlock. And like my entire goal is always to make Stock Unlock as easy as and as intuitive to understand and use as humanly possible. Like I will sit there looking at my computer for an hour, looking at a page, just being like, how can this be easier? Like what buttons are necessary? What buttons are not necessary? And as an investor myself who loves investing, like how can I make this easier for myself to use? I spend hours and hours just thinking about design. So I'm super happy to hear that. Um, you know, you think it's a it's an easy platform to use. Super, super happy. Um, what do you think about the insurance sector? Was gone. But we'd love to know what you think. The insurance sector, like, I don't know a lot about insurance, to be honest with you. I own Manulife because I think it's so cheap. It's not like a major position in my portfolio, but I own Manulife. And um, I think insurance is really cheap right now. I mean, we're seeing dividend yields approaching 7%. I think these companies are solid. I think they're going to continue to be solid for decades to come. I think insurance is one of those things where it's like, like you need insurance, like you literally need insurance to drive your car in North America. So I don't think insurance is going away. And if anything, I think insurance prices are only going to increase with inflation over the long term. So I think they're very solid businesses. I think they're yielding very high dividends right now. They're also buying back shares on top of high dividend yields, which I love. So I do own some insurance in my portfolio. Um, yeah, so this person right here, I'm sorry, if I try to pronounce this name, it's, I'm going to do a bad job. So I'm not going to embarrass myself. And I'm just going to talk about the comment. I'm from India. If you are invested 1000 US in India 10 years back in rupee term 50,000 50, when you invested. Yeah, so here's a good this is a this is a seriously good argument against investing in India, by the way. And the argument is that India has experienced a lot of historical inflation. Um, I totally agree. It's a fact. You got to think about inflation when you're investing in India. But here's the thing. HDB trades in US dollars. Okay. So this ticker is US dollars. And it's always been US dollars. And we can see back here in 2002, it was trading for $1.57 US. It is now trading for $57.45 US. And it's up about 4,000% over the past 20 years in US dollars. So yes, there has been inflation in India, but HDB, for example, has grown at a much faster rate than inflation. So even in terms of the US dollar, it's appreciated 4,000% over the past 20 years. 
I think it's going to continue appreciating in value over the long term as well. So I know that there's inflation and inflation will take away some returns, but I think the bank is going to continue growing at a much faster rate than inflation and provide a net positive return, even in terms of US dollars. So that's that's kind of my my thinking there with my um, Indian investments, at least. Um, all right, this is going to be the last question I answer. One, because my voice is hurting. <laughs> And two, because my girlfriend's going to get home from work. She's a spin instructor. She teaches spin on the weekend, on Saturdays. That's why I can do these live streams. She doesn't like me working on the weekend, but she works Saturday mornings, so I can work Saturday mornings. <laughs> but when she gets home, I gotta, I gotta get off, and she's gonna be, she's gonna be home here soon. All right, Tesla is moving into the artificial intelligence market on top of EVs, driverless tacky, tackies. <laughs> driverless taxis, reusable energy, and a data company. Do you think most people are selling Tesla short because they only value it as an EV company? No, I think people are selling Tesla short, which by the way, I would never do. But I think other people are doing it because Tesla is not valued as an electric vehicle company today. I think Tesla is already pricing in a lot of their other businesses. I'm going to sneeze. I can feel it. Okay, apparently not. No, okay. Um, I think Tesla is already pricing in a lot of their other businesses because I don't think Tesla is valued as an EV company. Um, if it were valued as an EV company, I think it would probably be worth about 200 billion. Let me think about this. I would say 200 to 250 billion is what I would value Tesla at based on their EV business. So with the company being worth 700 billion, that means that people are paying 450 billion for all of the other businesses, which by the way, are not producing revenue, are not producing profits or anything yet. Are they going to in the future? I don't know. So I think Tesla carries a lot of risk personally, and that's why I don't own it. I think that basically, I think that you don't need to be a successful, or sorry, you don't need Tesla in your portfolio to be a successful investor. Tesla could be a great investment. I have no idea. I think it's very expensive, but I also think it's very risky. And I think it is an unnecessary risk that a lot of investors such as myself don't need to take on to perform well in their own investment portfolio. So to simplify all that, I think Tesla at this price is an unnecessary risk for myself personally, which is why I don't own it. All right. Um, Got a question about CVS. I don't, I don't know. I really, I really got to stop the live stream. It's already been an hour and 21 minutes and I, yeah, I got to get out of it, but I love stocks. Okay. We're going to take a look at Neo quick. Present, share my screen. Yes. Neo. Okay. Neo. The reason I'm not doing CVS is because I don't know a lot about that sector. Honestly, I don't know a lot about the EV sector as well. But anyways, NEO, during the thing that happened over the past couple of years, this stock went from $3 up to about $60. It ran 1,740% in the matter of one year, okay? That's way too much. Like, I think electric vehicles were in a bubble, and I think this was a bubble, straight up. I think it was a bubble. $22 billion market cap today. Um, it has no free cash flow. What does the insight say? So the profitability of NEO is 1.5 out of 5, which is bad. Gross margin is bad. Operating margin negative. Net margin negative. Free cash flow negative. Unprofitable and losing money. Um, they have a lot of cash, though. They're diluting a little bit. Current ratio is 1.87. And cash more than current liabilities. So they do have a pretty strong balance sheet. Growth revenue is growing, gross profits growing, operating income growing, free cash flow is growing too. Hey, okay, so we're going to go to our freeform tool here. We're going to go to Neo. We're going to go to free cash flow. What did they do? What? The free cash flow negative. Yeah. What? Yeah. Revenue. Okay, we're going to look at revenue. Okay, so revenue is growing very quick. All right. Um, let's take a look at the past. I mean, even over the past two years, revenue has grown at a compounded annual growth rate of 130%. 
revenue is 5.6 billion but i mean the gross profit or the gross margin on this is 16 percent. so basically what is the gross profit okay yeah so basically okay here's how it works neo makes about 5.6 billion dollars in revenue but just to produce their cars cost them what would that be like four point four point like six billion dollars just to produce their their product after producing their product they have a gross profit of 908 million dollars okay so that's like the company's profit after making and delivering their product then on top of that you have operating expenses and all of the other expenses associated with like marketing a business you know running it paying salaries paying employees all these different things and that is what the gross profit is used for so what are the company's operating expenses for example operating expense is two billion dollars which means that their operating income is probably negative like 1.1 1.2 billion yeah 1.2 billion so this business this is why the auto industry like the auto industry doesn't trade at high valuations because it costs them so much money to generate the revenue and they don't have high profit margins so i saw people for example valuing neo last year off a price to sales ratio and i thought that was a mistake i mean think about this neo was selling for a 42 price to sales ratio in 2020 while the company had 16 percent gross margins and essentially wasn't making money like if you take a look at ford for example which is an auto company um it loads slow when i'm doing live streams i'm sorry um this stock this company the max price to sales ratio it has ever traded at well maybe not ever over the past few years at least over the past like decade the highest price to sales ratio ford got to was 0.7 not even one so ford historically has not even traded at its amount of sales and the reason for this is because the company has such low margins so it generates a lot of revenue but that revenue doesn't make it to the bottom line it doesn't actually make it to profits like what is the free cash flow margin free cash flow margin is like four percent so four percent of the company's entire revenue actually makes it to cash flow for investors and businesses are valued off profits like at the end of the day when you're buying a stock you're buying a business and as an owner of that business what you actually care about is profits like if a company is making a billion dollars in revenue think about this in real terms like think about think about if you were offered a business in real life not a stock but an actual business and that business was generating a billion dollars in revenue um but it was losing two billion dollars a year so yeah it's got a billion dollars in sales but it's unprofitable and it's losing two billion dollars a year would you buy that business just based on that like would you buy that business my answer would be a hard no because yeah it's doing a billion dollars in revenue but if i buy it i'm going to be losing two billion dollars a year that same thinking should apply to stocks so when i see a stock you know yeah sure the revenue is five six billion dollars and the revenue is growing but the company has razor thin margins and it doesn't make any money i look at that stock as a business i look at i look at the actual business and i'm like neo doesn't make money and i don't know if the company is going to make money and the other companies in its industry that have been around for decades don't make that much money so yeah i mean that's just kind of my thinking on neo personally i wouldn't own it i would not own it um but that's just me i'm not a financial advisor who knows right who knows i don't know what neo is going to do in the future but like just taking a look at the business and its profit potential and its industry peers and everything I just don't think that stock should be trading at a high price to sales ratio and what is the price to sales ratio today price to sales ratio today is still 4.3 which has come down significantly from 42 in 2020 but it's still high for an auto company in my opinion because again auto companies trade for price to sales ratios around one or below one so i still think it's arguably expensive but yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on Neo. Um, yeah, SM Finance. <clears throat> Tesla is one of those companies I will not own nor short. Just let it be. I could not agree with this statement more. Like, <laughs> yeah, I think Tesla is expensive and overvalued, but I also don't want to short it. 
because I could be wrong. <laughs> and that's just another unnecessary risk that I don't want to take on. So I'm just not going to touch it. Um, yeah. Are there ever going to be year over year insight scores for stock unlock? Yeah. So this is, this is something we also got asked about recently. So right now our insights basically compare trailing 12 months today versus trailing 12 months a year ago, but we want to extend that out so that the user can be like, okay, well, I want to see insights over the past five years. I want to see insights over the past decade because right now our insights are limited to just year over year, one year comparisons. And we think that we could get better insights if we extend the time frame out further historically. So this will come. I don't, basically we're working on portfolios right now, then screeners, and then we'll have more time to think about things like this, like improving existing features. So, but our main focus right now is portfolios and screeners. And then um, we'll take a look at other things, but yeah, this is a very good idea. So yeah. Um, yeah, guys, I'm sorry. My throat is really hurting. <laughs> I love live streaming. We've already been an hour and a half, but yeah, this this really hurts. My, I shouldn't say really hurts, but my throat is starting to hurt. And again, my girlfriend is going to be home soon. So I got to get off the live stream, everyone. I'm sorry. I wish I could sit here and talk all day. I genuinely love talking about stocks. But um, yeah, I just, I just, I got to get out of here soon. What about BIP? <clears throat> Eduardo says, what about BIP? I talked about BIP earlier on in this live stream. I'm sorry, I don't know where it was, but uh, yeah, I explained BIP earlier on in this live stream. Shane Kelly, one more stock. <laughs> I wish, I wish, I wish I could talk about stocks all day. But um, yeah, I got to end the live stream here. Thank you guys so much for watching. We're at an hour and a half now perfectly. That works out great. So thank you, thank you everyone so much for tuning in. I love doing live streams. It's a great time. And I love just interacting with all of you. So um, we'll be back next week. I'm going to do my best to get Nick on the live stream as well, who is one of our co-founders. He's the third co-founder of Stock Unlock. Jake is going to be back next week as well. He's he's out. He's um, having a good time for his birthday this weekend. Um, in the He's like in the woods somewhere, I think, in a cabin. But yeah, next week, they should be here. I got one question right here. Any changes in Capital Power Corporation prices come down recently? Quick, no. Nothing has changed. I'm still holding personally. And uh, yeah, I just think the utility sector sold off last week. I got to stop talking about stocks. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate it. And um, if you're not already subscribed to Stock Unlock or got your free trial, you should go and get a free trial. It's totally free. Enter in your email. You can get 14 days. No problem. Jake is cheating on me right now. I know. We've talked about this too. We've talked about it, you know? But the man's not loyal, I guess. <laughs> but yeah all right thank you everyone so much for watching i gotta get out of here um i'll see you all next week have a great weekend thank you so much for all your comments and uh <laughs> shane <laughs> and yeah i'll see you guys later have a great weekend everyone